carrying on. His part of his re recent research on the use of iridium as electrocatalyst. So welcome, Dr. Yagmi. The session is yours, please. Thank you, Leila. Uh, do you see my screen now? Yes. All right, great. So thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Um, so for today's talk, we'll start by uh, a brief outline of hydrogen-based uh, en hydrogen energy economy. Then we'll go into water electrolyzers, what the current status and uh, existing challenges are. Then we'll go more deeply into the catalysts that are used in water electrolysis uh, and uh, also talk about other components outside of uh, catalysts that are in, uh, specifically in proton exchange membrane electrolyzers. Then towards the end, I'll briefly dis discuss about regenerative electrolyzers or, or fuel cells and conclude with opportunities and brief outlook for the technology. So this, uh, this uh, nice graphic from U.S. Department of Energy illustrates different sources of energy that we derive our energy from uh, currently. And on the right-hand side, there are different ways we use energy. Uh, now, most of the energy we use right now is uh, derived from fossil reserves, obviously because of uh, carbon-intensive uh, energy release process the emissions make the uh, process unsustainable. Now, in order to mitigate that, what we'll need to do is we'll need to ramp up or scale up the uh, energy we derive from the renewables. Now, some of the alternative sources of energy I've listed here include solar and wind energy. However, if we are going to scale up the portion of energy we derive from renewables, what we really also need is we need a really good and efficient energy carrier uh, so that we can move, move massive amount of energy just like we do using uh, our gas infrastructure, electric grid, and so on and so forth right now. Now, that's where we think hydrogen has a really vital role to play. Uh, so if we use intermittent renewable sources, specific, specifically solar and wind, Obviously, there is a mismatch between demand and supply of uh, energy from renewables. However, when there is excess renewable, uh, then we can use the excess energy to generate hydrogen from water splitting. And then uh, we can use that hydrogen either as a chemical feedstock for uh, per sectors like uh, fertilizer synthesis, um, up, uh, biomass upgrading, oil upgrading, or metal refining. Or we can use that hydrogen uh, to feed into something like a fuel cell or direct hydrogen in, uh, injection, uh, inje injection uh, um, engines and then gen uh, generate back power. So, they, so we can think of hydrogen as, hydrogen as an energy storage technology, just like battery capacitors, pump hydrogen, and so on and so forth. And we think hydrogen will be part of the solution. So to generate hydrogen, we use electrolyzers. Then if we need to release power, we're going to use fuel cells to put that energy back into where it's needed. Now we already use massive amounts of hydrogen uh, uh, in industry. Uh, we generate numbers vary, but it's somewhere between 80 to 90 million metric tons of hydrogen is generated. However, about 95, 96% of the hydrogen that we currently use comes from natural gas reforming. Most of it from central, uh, central hydrogen generation system or on-site generation for, comp uh, for industries like ammonia synthesis and others. Now, if we want to make this uh, renewable based, what we need to do or what is forecasted to happen in the long term is that a lot of hydrogen that's coming from, uh, coming from natural gas reforming will be replaced by electrolysis. Now, if we talk about electrolysis, there are uh, different type of technology that exist out there. And broadly, we can uh, divide them between low temperature electrolysis and high temperature electrolysis. Within low temperature electrolysis, again, there are a couple of ways to distinguish them. 
we can, uh, we can uh, think of them as alkaline electrolysis or acidic electrolysis. Within alkaline electrolysis, the traditional way of generating hydrogen or traditional way of doing electrolysis is membrane-free electrolysis where um, we all did this probably sometime in, in our middle school. You have some kind of a caustic soda, chloroalkali solution. Then you stick in two electrodes in there uh, in an uh, alkaline environment and you generate hydrogen on one side, oxygen on the other side. And this, uh, uh, these both uh, a a cathodic and anodic reaction can be catalyzed by nickel iron and uh, cobalt based catalyst. Now, if we move on to membrane based electrolysis, again, there are two different types. The first one on, in, the, in the middle here is alkaline exchange membrane electrolysis where the, it's the hydroxide ion that moves from cathode to anode. And uh, this membrane right here is the hydroxide conducting membrane. Um, uh, just like on the membrane free alkaline electrolyzer, AEMs uh, also use iron, cobalt and nickel based uh, uh, catalyst for cathodes and anodes. Um, if we move on to now the acidic or, uh, or proton exchange membrane electrolyzers, Instead of the hydroxide ions going through the membrane, this time it's proton that travels from anode to cathode. Uh, and the catalysts for proton exchange membrane electrolyzers are on the anode side, you need iridium oxide. On the cathode side, we need platinum uh, or some, some combination, either, uh, uh, either alloys or some supported catalysts here. Now, on the, if we talk about solid oxide uh, uh, electrolyzers, in solid oxide electrolyzers, instead of a polymer membrane here, we use a ceramic, which conducts, uh, instead of a proton or hydroxide ions, you actually, uh, the uh, ceramic membrane conducts oxide, oxygen ions from anode to cathode. The distinct advantage here being that you're going to operate at really high temperatures. Now, if we look at all these four technologies I have presented here, uh, with the, the main issue with the uh, traditional alkaline membrane, al alkaline electrolysis is that the startup and shutdown times are quite sluggish. It's not as, uh, you can't start or shut down as easily. Also, the hydrogen that you generate from traditional alkaline electrolyzer, it, it, uh, it's generated at ambient pressure. So you need, you either use it at ambient pressure or you have to externally compress it. Uh, alk uh, anion exchange membrane and solid oxide uh, or ceramic membrane fuels uh, electrolyzers, they are uh, very promising. However, the technology is not quite ready for commer commercialization. So what we end up with is if we want to really scale up hydrogen generation using electrolysis, we're uh, in the short and medium term, we are really stuck with uh, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers and they are already commercialized at megawatt scales. So if we go a little bit further and look at how uh, uh, compare the cost of hydrogen that's generated from electrolysis versus uh, carbon intensive methods, this is such as uh, natural gas reforming, you can easily see from this graphic uh, that Hydrogen from electrolysis tends to be quite uh, expensive. Um, again, this there is variation in price depending on what what electrolysis you use and, and where you actually generate the hydrogen. So if we want to really scale up hydrogen generated from renewable sources, we really need to bring the price of hydrogen from, uh, that's generated from electrolysis down to the level of hydrogen that comes from natural gas. So basically it's uh, going below $2 per kilogram or $1 per kilogram in the really long, the long run. So a lot of cost for the electrolysis is actually coming from the uh, price of electricity itself. Now, if the, uh, we know that the train, the, the price train for uh, solar and wind generated electricity is, has been falling down historically. If this train continues, we will see further reduction, further reduction in the electricity prices and that will help in the long run. But as academic researchers, where we can really contribute in this field 
is reducing this capital cost. Of course, the operation and management cost will also come down uh, as we scale up and as we become uh, better at uh, doing the whole, uh, uh, managing the process. Now, in terms of research uh, to reduce the capital cost, uh, the first thing we really think about is, uh, is how to uh, make the catalyst and other components in electrolyzer cheaper and cost effective. Now, before we go into the material side of it, let's go back and look at the, uh, look at the structure of proton exchange membrane electrolyzer. If we look at it more deeply, what happens in an uh, electrolyzer is you feed water on the anode side, that water breaks into protons, electrons and oxygen yeah, using the electrons that you derive from either from the grid or let's say from a solar panel or a wind turbine. That's where the energy is being used. Now on the anode side, you release oxygen. On the cathode side, uh, you, you generate hydrogen. And this, the uh, beautiful thing about this proton exchange or membrane-based electrolysis is that you can actually compress this hydrogen as it's generated. So you, you, you may not have to use an external mechanical pump in this case. Looking at the electrochemical side of it, um, uh, under thermodynamic conditions, um, the uh, lowest potential you can generate hydrogen or the cathodic reaction, hydrogen evolution reaction, HER, should occur at zero, vo uh, zero volt. However, there is, uh, there is uh, energy penalty you have to pay to overcome the activation energies. And this extra energy you spend to overcome this activation energy, we call it over potential. So, uh, so I'll keep referring to, uh, referring to this uh, extra energy as over potential, if I may. Then on the anode side, similarly, uh, under, thermal, under ideal condition, you should be able to drive OER at 1.23 volts, but because this is a four electron reaction, it tends to be quite sluggish and we, it has much bigger over potential somewhere, uh, something like 300, 350 millivolt is acceptable in this, in this field. Okay. If we look a little more closely inside the structure of our pro proton exchange membrane uh, electrolyzer, what you'll see is there are different structural parts, things like end plates, which hold the whole cell together. Then there are current collectors, gaskets, and so on and so forth. However, today we're not going to look at uh, all these structural or transport uh, components. What we're going to concentrate is something called membrane electrode assemblies. Um, so if we look at the, uh, if we want to reduce the capital cost uh, for electrolysis, what we have to look at is first, where is this, uh, where is the cost coming from? So if we look at the breakdown of this cost here and on the X axis, we are seeing how the cost, uh, how the uh, cost breakdown changes as you ramp up the production rate from somewhere like a uh, few units to about 50,000 units and even further, there are, breakdowns if you are interested uh, uh, in this source. They go up to five, they have done calculations up to half a million units. Okay, so if we look at this cost breakdown, what you will see is that CCM or uh, membrane electrode assembly accounts for a majority of the stack cost, what we say. The one above is um, uh, uh, our ba balance of plant. And uh, so we're going to concentrate down here. So. Uh, within, the, within the PM electrolyzer, the stack costs about 40% of the system cost. And within the, uh, within the stack, the CCM costs for about 50%. And majority of that, this catalytic, uh, majority of the cost for this membrane electrode assembly actually comes from this iridium oxide. Because you really have to use, um, in commercial electrolyzers, PEM electrolyzers, um, we use about uh, somewhere between three to five milligram per cm square iridium loading on the anode. On the cathode side, you can get away with uh, less than 0 0.5 milligram per cm square platinum loading. So there is a lot of emphasis on reducing uh, iridium loading on the, on the electrolyzers. Now, why is uh, iridium so expensive? In order, uh, in order to understand that, we really have to look at um, the 
global production of iridium and where the iridium is coming from. Now, if we look at this chart, uh, uh, this, uh, this chart illustrates all the different elements or different metals, uh, different components in the, of the periodic table elements. And the Y axis is telling us what is the global production per year in, uh, in kgs. So if we look at it and uh, uh, look at platinum and iridium, you'll see that global production is really low. Everything that's in pink color here is, you, you might, um, we can call it precious metals. You can see that platinum and iridium are really low, almost at the bottom. The other caveat that we need to understand is that iridium is actually side product of platinum mining. So it's the uh, price of iridium and platinum will be closely, uh, will track each other really closely. The, others, uh, the other caveat that I haven't listed here is iridium and platinum are not well distributed around the world. About majority of the, both iridium and platinum actually comes from South Africa. So you can imagine uh, uh, the market instability if something happens in South Africa. So, so that was the products. And the other, the other thing to keep in mind is that how much iridium or platinum is actually out there. Uh, so this, this chart here is telling you, uh, is uh, plotting uh, on the X axis, the annual production that we just talked about. On the Y axis is the actual crustal abundance. Again, if you look at where iridium and platinum are, there isn't really a lot of iridium, iridium and platinum on, uh, for us to use for electrolysis. So ideally, what we would like to do is we'd like to move away from uh, catalysts that are based on iridium and platinum and would like to go to, would like to use things like titanium, iron, nickel, and cobalt. Although we should be careful with uh, including cobalt in this because because of, uh, because of the amount of lithium ion batteries we're, uh, we're using. All right, so there, uh, there has been a lot, there have been a lot of reports on how we can actually maximize uh, either replace iridium or uh, replace iridium and platinum or try to maximize the use of iridium and platinum. So in terms of research, how we go about uh, do, doing this, is it's not really uh, practical or feasible to put every new catalyst inside a really complex system that I'm denoting here. This is the membrane electrode assembly. Uh, it, I, I deliberately picked this figure to show how complex this system can be. You have liquid, uh, liquid gas interfaces, you have liquid solid interfaces, uh, solid gas interfaces, it becomes really complicated. Anytime you're looking at an exploratory catalyst, if you put in here, it becomes really difficult and expensive to analyze, uh, analyze how that catalyst is going to perform towards a particular reaction, right? So instead of putting our exploratory catalyst into membrane electrode assembly, what we tend to do is we use something called um, half cell electrodes or rotating disc electrode. These, these systems are much simpler. You can simply uh, uh, make a thin film of, film of your catalyst on the top of your working electrode. Then uh, you can put in that working electrode in, a, uh, in an electrolyte to mimic acidic condition. If you are, if you are uh, a screening catalyst for uh, proton exchange membrane electrolyzer or Instead of using perchloric acid, you, you can use potassium hydroxide if it's for AEM. Now, the idea here is that we, this whole process should be targeted ultimately to integrate these catalysts into membrane electrode assembly. Now, this is a really nice, quick and easy system. However, it does have some drawbacks. Now, if we look at the, look at the graph here, it's, uh, it illustrates nicely how this, uh, the process is simple and it can, uh, it can uh, really help us understand the inherent activities. What it can't do, uh, what, it, what it cannot do that are, uh, these half cell RD based uh, investigations is that it really doesn't reflect the real condition that, in, uh, that exists inside a, a proton exchange membrane electrolyzer. But, and it also cannot reflect all the mass transport, uh, mass transport resistances. However, it's, it's been quite useful for the community to screen hundreds and thousands of catalysts. 
Now the pro the way we the way we look at different catalysts uh, as an example is that here I'm uh, I'm illustrating what happens when you have um, uh, non-precious metal catalysts such as uh, metal phosphides and metal carbides, right? So the first thing we do is we change the potential. So remember, HER should happen at zero volt, but because of uh, activation energy, we have to go negative potentials. We scan potentials. Then uh, at a certain potential, you see onset of activity. Then we look at what is the over potential that you have to apply in order to ge generate certain amount of uh, activity. Let's say 10 milliamp per cm square for a, for a comparison here. The other things we can look at using a rotating disk electrode is things like turnover frequencies or other kinetic parameters, something like Tafel slope, right? Then, um, the, uh, then we can also quickly look at uh, durability of, your, of our catalyst. So we can run these, uh, what we call linear sweep voltammetry curves. Then we can, uh, uh, we can run actual activity for, e it can be either constant, but we can run it at constant potential or constant uh, current. And then every so often here, we were, uh, we were uh, analyzing our catalyst or activity after every six hours. You can see that over time, some catalysts will degrade. Be uh, the reason I'm saying they're degrading is because the over potential is increasing over time here. A good catalyst, over potential will remain the same after let's say six, uh, 18, 20 hours at all. That gives us, a, gives us a good idea about whether these catalysts are going to be viable for uh, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers or not. Okay, so there has been a lot of work over the years trying to figure out if we are trying to explore if we can replace iridium and platinum from electrolyzers and fuel cells. Similar activity has been done in fuel cell as well. So if we look at this chart, it really highlights where the real issue is. Now, if we look for the, for the base system, so when we say base for OER and NTR, we are talking about alkaline exchange membrane electrolyzer. If we look at it here, we, we really don't have to use iridium and platinum as, as this chart uh, nicely uh, illustrates here. You can work, uh, you, we can use a lot of nickel, iron and cobalt based uh, materials on both anode and cathode side. If we go on the acid or the proton exchange membrane electrolyzer side, on the cathode side where we, where we are trying to run a hydrogen evolution reaction, we have discovered a whole library of materials that can do hydrogen oxidation, hydrogen evolution reaction in acid electrolyte. However, if you look on the oxygen evolution side, there is really nothing outside of iridium and ruthenium. Those are the only two materials that really work. On top of that, when we look at the stability or durability of these materials, Ruthenium falls apart pretty quickly. So we are really stuck with iridium um, per, uh, for the anode side of PEM electrolyzers. So that was the activity. Uh, the, there we were looking at the activity. The other way to look at the, uh, for the viability of these catalysts is to look at the stability. Uh, this is a really nice way of uh, uh, screening stability of these uh, exploratory catalysts. So what we are looking at here is the x-axis is the over potential that's needed at t equal to zero at the beginning of uh, your investigation. Then we'll, we'll run some kind of either chronoamperometry or chrono uh, uh, constant current or constant voltage uh, uh, experiments. And then again, may measure the over potential required. So a stable good catalyst would fall somewhere along this line. While if some uh, if something degrades, it should go the over potential should be it should be in this region out here. Again, if we look on the excuse me on the alkaline side, we see that there are quite a few materials for both HER and OER that fall along this diagonal line. That means we had a we have a lot of choices. Same thing on the acid side when you're looking at uh, the cathodic hydrogen evolution reaction. However, if we look on the OER or the anodic side, you can see that except for iridium, 
you don't really have a lot of choice. Everything is outside where the over potentials does uh, really do, don't make any sense for them to be put into an electrolyzer. So in the short term, we are really stuck uh, with iridium for the anode side. So the strategy for uh, PEM electrolyzer technology is to try to maximize iridium mass activity. We, we want to get away with as little iridium as we can. So ultimate goal would be to uh, get to something like uh, single atom uh, electrocatalysis. Um, and in order to get there or try to get there, uh, we, there are uh, traditional, um, traditional methods or strategies of improving activity and stability. One way to do that is increasing the, increase the number of active sites in your catalyst, or the other way is to increase the intrinsic activity. So um, different groups around the world, um, uh, what we have been doing is we have been adapting these classical um, catalyst designing strategies to come up with different forms of iridium. Now, because this iridium catalyst doesn't matter how you, uh, which strategy you use uh, along these both uh, both paths, uh, one thing that we have to be really careful with is if we are going to use any kinds of support in our uh, catalyst uh, uh, structure, that support itself also has to withstand the uh, acidic uh, electrochemical environment and the uh, PEM electrolyzer anodes. So. What that does, what that really means is that rules out some really favorable material, something like carbon. If we could use carbon, that would be great. But unfortunately, we can't use carbon. It will easily uh, turn into carbon dioxide. Okay, so, uh, so one of the, uh, one of the uh, support material that's, that has been, uh, that we have tried to uh, use for a long time is uh, titanium dioxide because it's stable. It should be stable under OER conditions. Um, and there are commercial materials that use uh, TiO2 as the, support, uh, as the catalyst support. However, uh, the commercial material itself actually contains 75 weight percent iridium and only 25 weight percent, uh, weight percent uh, iridium. You might say why the real, uh, the, um, the real problem with, uh, with uh, supporting anything on TiO2 is that because TiO2 is electrically insulating, in order to get to some kind of reasonable conductivity in your catalyst air or in your catalyst particle, you really have to get to about 75 weight percent. This, uh, that's why this graph nicely illustrates why it has to be so high. So our idea with this project was that instead of putting, instead of putting uh, our iridium particles straight onto TiO2, uh, uh, like this here, is, uh, in order to avoid using really high uh, iridium loading, such as in the commercial, uh, uh, commercial uh, supported iridium catalyst. Our idea is that we'll put a really thin layer of either platinum or gold, so that, uh, so that we form a conductive layer. Now, once you have, once you form this really thin conductive layer around TiO2, then you can nanostructure the iridium itself so that you can actually lower the amount of ir uh, iridium without uh, paying a penalty for uh, in terms of conductivity. Then you can play further with, uh, then you can nanostructure further both your conductive layer of platinum or gold and iridium itself. So that basic idea here is that you form a, continuous conductive layer of your uh, uh, platinum layer and iridium layer. So, so that was the cartoon version of the catalyst. So we actually started synthesizing, synthesizing our catalyst. And you can see from the TEM graphs here that you can form really about two to three nano, uh, nanometer uh, platinum particles that are evenly distributed on, the, on titanium dioxide. Then once you, once you have this even coat, uh, even coat of uh, platinum nanoparticles and TiO2, then you can uh, put iridium on top and uh, use them as OER catalysts. Uh, so once we had synthesized these catalysts and um, 
I didn't mention too much about the synthesis methods here, but you can use uh, uh, you can use very scalable synthesis methods such as wetness impregnation and thermochem uh, thermochemical treatments to generate these uh, generate these catalysts. Now, once we have once we had our uh, uh, supported iridium catalyst, the first thing we do is we look uh, we use as I mentioned earlier half cell rotating disk electrode configuration to look at the uh, look at the activity of these materials. So what you are seeing here is that when you have iridium that's not supported uh, that's not supported on platinum coated TiO2, the activity is almost non-existent. As soon as you, as soon as you take the catalyst and oxidize it in in an oxidizing environment, so you can see how it the activity. There is some activity before you anneal, but after you anneal, the activity is non-existent. However, when you have when you support the same iridium on a platinum coated TiO2, you see that the the activity is uh, there is quite a bit of activity that still remains behind. Then, for comparison. This is the Umicore commercial catalyst that has 75 weight percent iridium on TiO2. So you can see that the, the activity of our catalyst is quite comparable to them. Now that's one way of looking at uh, electro, uh, electrochemical activity. The other way to look at, uh, look at the same data is that you, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, look at the data in terms of mass activity in terms of iridium, milligrams of iridium, let's say here. So again, the, the point we are trying to illustrate here is that we can, we can generate higher iridium mass activity than the commercial catalyst, even though the iridium loading in our catalyst is about only one third of what you have here. So this contains about 25 weight percent iridium, this catalyst, commercial catalyst, contains about 75 weight percent iridium. Uh, then, once you once we know that this uh, catalyst, like I presented here, are promising, then we do we quickly do some uh, uh, stability tests, and uh, we see that our catalyst is quite stable over uh, over a period of, period of a uh, few hours, while the commercial catalyst uh, activity continues to come down. Uh, and then uh, once we um, once we had our catalyst, uh, once the catalyst showed reasonable activity in half cell configuration, we also integrated the same catalyst into a membrane electrode assembly and uh, ran it in an electrolyzer. As you can see here, the, the our catalyst, again, that only contains one third of iridium content compared to commercial catalyst performs almost uh, similar Lead to uh, similar to what uh, what the commercial catalyst does, and the intrinsic activity or a tuple slope in uh, uh, tuple slope here are also really similar uh, similar to what the commercial catalyst shows. Now, in order to try to understand what could be happening when you have that thin layer, conductive layer of platinum and gold, we we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, uh, surface characterization techniques such as XPS here. So what we see is if you have this uh, platinum coated, uh, if you have this platinum conductive layer between your iridium catalyst and TiO2, the structure, the surface structure really doesn't change. It remains almost the same, uh, whether you uh, as synthesized versus anneal, which, which basically means oxidizing your catalyst. Then, however, when you have something, uh, when you have a conductive layer like gold, which, which we deliberately made it so that it was not uniform, or if you have a catalyst that doesn't have the conductive layer here, you can clearly see that the surface or the iridium uh, oxidation state is clearly changing before and after. Uh, in terms of conductivity, again, when you take your catalyst, so this iridium is directly on TiO2. Without, uh, without any platinum conductive layer. So if you take that catalyst and anneal it, you can see that the conductivity uh, changes from something like about 30, 35 to uh, less than 10 uh, uh, semen per cm. However, if you, have your, if you have this conductive platinum interlayer, you can see that the conductivity remains quite high, even uh, after it's uh, 
after it's exposed to oxidizing conditions. And the conductivity is better than the commercial Umicore catalyst, which, is, which has 75 weight percent iridium. Now, most of the, all of the work I've described, uh, described here was, uh, uh, was conducted while I was at Berkeley Lab. And we have continued on the, uh, on the project. We have taken the project forward. And what we are doing now here is we are looking at different ratios of iridium platinum and, T and TiO to our titanium dioxide in these catalysts. So what we do here is we pair it. So we have 30 per, all these catalysts except this iridium oxide, which is a commercial catalyst, have 50 weight percent TiO2. And the other 50 weight percent is coming from either iridium or platinum. So when we go from 20 weight percent platinum to about two and a half weight, weight percent platinum, you see that there is a trend in activity. And this 45 weight percent iridium, 5 weight percent platinum tends to give us the best activity as you can see, see here. It's almost comparable to unsupported commercial iridium oxide, which is the black line here. Again, normalizing your activity to milligram of iridium really highlights what's happening inside these, uh, inside these catalysts. And you can see the mass activity of this 45 weight percent iridium is a lot better than what you see in, uh, in other catalysts. Okay, once we know that the 45 weight percent iridium, five weight percent platinum performs the best, next thing for us to do is how much lower with uh, uh, platinum group metal can we get away with? So we started reducing the amount of uh, platinum group metal in, metal in our catalyst. Again, we did the same screening. What we see here is there is what I call the Magic, uh, magic ratio. Uh, when you have this 30 weight percent PGM, which translates to about 27 weight percent uh, uh, iridium, uh, 23 weight percent iridium, and 7 weight percent platinum, gives you even better activity than when you have 50 weight percent PGM. So we were we were really encouraged with this uh, with these results. We, again, uh, like I mentioned previously, we also looked at some of the durability tests. So what we are doing here is instead of scanning, um, uh, scanning uh, quickly scanning uh, voltage and uh, current, we're holding our uh, potential at these given potentials per two hours each time. And you can see that both our uh, 45 weight person iridium and the 23 weight person iridium catalyst. They are reasonably stable over time. Um, so this was very encouraging. We, then we integrated our catalysts into, the, into an electrolyzer. And this is press data from uh, this week. And you can see that when we, um, when we integrate our catalyst, so this purple line is the, is the in-house generated catalyst you can see that it gives really good activity. This is very encouraging. And it's very comparable to commercial iridium oxide. The other thing to look at really is how much iridium is in these two membranes. So the, our in-house uh, generated catalyst only has 1.18 milligram, uh, about one milligram per cm square iridium. But the commercial catalyst we deliberately kept it really high so that this is what the commercial electrolyzers use. You can see that the, uh, our catalyst performs really well. Now to see the effect of uh, the, the conductive layer, you really have to normalize it to mass of iridium. So when you normalize the whole thing to mass activity, you can really see the effect of supporting iridium catalyst on, uh, on, on a conductive support. Uh, here and we're getting two amp per milligram uh, iridium mass activity here. Now, how far are, how are we in terms of state of the art here? So this is something that uh, we did when I was still at Berkeley Lab in the US. And you can see that if you really engineer these catalysts, just iridium oxide catalyst, and uh, uh, try, to uh, try to reduce the amount of iridium, you can actually generate as high a mass activity as 100 amp per cm square, per 100 amp per milligram. We're not there yet, uh, but there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, but we are optimizing our catalyst there. Hopefully, in the future, I'll have uh, I'll have uh, 
similar activities to share with you. Okay, so in order to get to these activities, so what we really have to think about is uh, these membrane electrode assembly fabrication methods tend are really important. And uh, when, we, when we are trying to optimize the activity of electrocatalyst, we actually ne also need to think what other components we are using, something like porous choice of porous transfer layer, membranes, and ion emerge. And uh, all our RD investigation, they should really be targeted towards, instead of uh, looking for uh, high activity or, uh, or durability in the, for the RD, we should really look at how we, how we can improve the RD condition so that if it reflects the MEA, um, uh, it reflects the MEA conditions as well. Okay, so the other use, if I, um, in the next five or 10 minutes, what I want to illustrate is these platinum and iridium con uh, containing catalysts also have the potential to be used in uh, uh, unitized reversible fuel cells or electrolyzers. Now, the, the way to think about these systems is that if you want a single device to act as electrolyzer or fuel cell, one of these catalyst layers, either anode or cathode, has to contain both, uh, both platinum and iridium because they will have to either do OER and ORR together or do OER and HOR together, right? So, so the main material challenge in terms of membrane electrode assembly here is that how do you combine this anode catalyst layer with the platinum, uh, with the platinum catalyst so that you can make, make the catalyst layer reversible here. So I, we think that's where our, our iridium and platinum containing catalysts are going to be quite useful in the future. Now, in terms of transport challenges, again, try to re-emphasize how complicated these uh, electrolyzer or fuel cell systems can be. You can see that when you are, uh, when you are running it as, a, as an electrolyzer, you have to let water in, oxygen out on, the, on one side, then hydrogen out on the other side. Now, if you run the same system and in fuel cell, now you have to let hydrogen in and oxygen in or oxygen or air in on the other side. At the same time, you are gener generating liquid water, you have to maintain conductivity. So it becomes quite a complicated system. And when you are trying to, uh, trying to device these re regenerative fuel cell, you actually have to think about all, uh, every aspect of these technology. So we have looked at, these, uh, look at the, looked at these devices before by combining iridium and platinum. So what we are doing here is that we are starting on the electrolyte side with 100% iridium. And then we started mixing in some amount of platinum. As you expect, as you replace some of the iridium with platinum, the activity degrades. Uh, it, saw, it follows the expected train. But what we did not expect was on the fuel cell side, when we start introducing, uh, when we start introducing more and more Irid, uh, more and more platinum into our system, right? The activity should be getting better, but that's not the trend we see. So this 70% iridium, 30% platinum should be performing much better, this, better than this 90% platinum, 90% uh, iridium, 10% platinum. We don't see the trend and we were quite baffled with uh, what was happening here. And we're still, uh, we're still uh, trying to understand how these iridium and platinum interact with it, each other in the catalyst layer. And um, these devices, these reversible fuel cell devices, they can operate up to about 60% uh, round trip efficiency. If you actually, uh, instead of using air as the cathode gas, if you put oxygen, yeah, we have, uh, we have shown that you can get round trip efficiency of up to 60 degrees, uh, 60, uh, 60%. Uh, I'll be happy to discuss these, this technology if uh, somebody has a specific question, but for the sake of time, uh, the sake of time, we'll move on. Uh, so, so that's one way of thinking, uh, improving activity, trying to uh, optimize your uh, uh, iridium or platinum ratio. The other way to think about these devices is actually engineering the catalyst layers themselves. So what we did, 
is we looked at two different, uh, two different uh, uh, catalyst layer engineering technique. One, something called spray coating. The other, something called doctor blading. They're just two different ways we make our catalyst layers. So if we look at the doctor bladed catalyst layer, you can see wh where the catalysts are, uh, catalysts are and where, the, where your uh, uh, pores are, or this is the void, uh, void space within the catalyst layer. Now, if we compare, if we take this and compare it to what's happening inside a spray coated catalyst layer, you should clearly see that the distribution of pores or void space is quite different. And this is illustrated better here. You can see that when you doctor blade uh, a fab one fabrication technique, you see these long open channels of void spaces. While on a spray coated system, the tortuosity or the tortuosity is quite high. This graph here is uh, illustrating exactly that. You can see that irrespective of which direction you are looking at, you see that the doctor bladed tortuosity of doctor bladed catalyst layer is quite low. Now, how does that compare uh, in terms of device performance? You can see that the, both the fuel cell and electrolyzer performance for the doctor bladed uh, doctor bladed systems that have straight channels or straight, uh, uh, por por st straight pores, they perform better both in as fuel cell and as an electrolyzer. It's really uh, obvious when you look at the electrolyzer side, you can see that these straight pores in doctor bladed system gives a really steady performance. But when you spray coat it because of the tortuosity of, uh, because of very, roundabout pathway, you start seeing some mass, uh, mass limited uh, transport region, onset of mass transport limited region. And you see, uh, we also see that the round trip efficiency of systems that are doctor bladed with straight pores are better than those from the, those from the spray coated uh, system. So the take home message from, from this without explaining too much of what's going on here, is that you can actually improve activity and durability by uh, engineering better catal uh, better catalyst layer in addition to the uh, in addition to better performing catalysts themselves. So where are the opportunities or the technology gaps in uh, proton exchange membrane electrolyzers? We would like to uh, we'd like to design better I mean lighter and more stable uh, end plates and uh, bipolar plates. Per, because of the highly oxidizing environment, you really have, we are really stuck with either titanium or uh, stainless steel materials. If we could make them lighter, that save cost, a capital cost. Then uh, we would also like economic and corrosion, uh, co uh, corrosion resistant current collectors, uh, the conductive, uh, com conductive components of, uh, of our electrolyzer cells and stacks. Uh, we'd also like lighter and durable flow fields, uh, PTLs, porous transport layers, uh, and other transport layers and, uh, like bipolar plates and so on and so forth. The real hidden cost in this technology is in fabrication and machining. Because you have to use a lot of titanium components, we can reduce a lot of capital cost by moving to something that is more uh, machinable, lighter and softer. Um, on top of being uh, being efficient and uh, active towards uh, any uh, electrochemical activity you require, as uh, as we have discussed today uh, in at length, economic and durable alternatives to platinum and iridium ca catalysts are obviously highly highly desirable, and there are quite a lot of groups around the world that are working on this field. Uh, so, in conclusion, hopefully, I've given given you a really broad overview of uh, overview that supported iridium catalyst can improve the mass activity of our iridium catalyst in uh, uh, water electrolyzers. Uh, I've also shown you how optimizing the iridium uh, to platinum to uh, titanium dioxide ratio can maximize the iridium activity. The cat, uh, when, when we are optimizing our catalyst, not just for electrolyzer, but for fuel cells or redox flow batteries, what we should really consider is we should, we should take a holistic approach. It really makes a difference 
what other components are you, you are using and how you are fabricating uh, your devices and putting, uh, putting uh, different components together. And uh, as I showed you here, Iridium Platinum Tiato is because the, the catalyst we are developing, they have both Iridium and Platinum in the same, uh, same structure. They, ha they have the potential to improve reversible fuel cell as well. And as I showed you, engineering catalyst layers uh, is one strategy uh, on how you can improve performance and durability of, durabilities of, the, of these devices. Um, I, uh, I should also thank, I would, I would like to thank uh, people who have helped me do all of this work uh, over the years, um, starting with uh, uh, our group at Manchester Met. Um, um, Thomas Lau is the postdoc, uh, the UK Cat Hub postdoc who is working on the project spe specifically. Uh, then at Berkeley Lab, a lot of the work I uh, presented today was done by Song Pen, myself, Eden, who is a PhD student at the University of Washington now, uh, and our PI NAB. And this is the larger uh, energy conversion group at Berkeley Lab. Uh, beyond that, I would also like to thank all the collaborators at, uh, we, uh, collaborators on our UK Cat Hub uh, project, uh, Dr. Laurie King and Pro, uh, uh, Professor Pete Kelly. Uh, and our PhD student, Deborah, at uh, Manchester Fuel Cell Innovation Center, and all the people who have helped me over the years on, uh, on these research activity and all the funding agencies and institutions that have been critical for me over the years. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So, thank you so much. Uh, Yaga for this interesting and very informative talk and uh, we are open for question. There are already three questions. So the first one is um, from Sahid and uh, he's asking that um, uh, if uh, he wants to know how you can distinguish this differentiate between interfacial and core shell structure. How? Uh... I mean, the easiest way to do that is basically do something like TEM uh, combined with EDS um, from a, a materials characterization point of view. Um, from electrochemical, um, electrochemical uh, methods, that would be quite hard to distinguish. I think TEM combined with EDS is the best way to, uh, best way to look at the core cell structure versus just uh, adjoint on a catalyst uh, support surface. Okay, thank you. And the other question is from uh, Vinod, is asking uh, why the, diff the significant difference on activity on annealing for gold and platinum interlighted, what, why is there is that much big difference between these two that? So, and what's the qu second question is, what's the thickness or loading of the platinum interlayer. So does using platinum layer using defect? A defect, a de, what is that? This is the purpose of reducing, this the purpose is the reducing the PGM loading or a cost? Uh, that's a great question. So we specifically picked uh, gold and platinum to try to distinguish between the two systems. So the difference, real difference between gold and platinum is that uh, platinum likes to form really thin uh, layer. It forms a really thin uniform layer, uh, but iridium doesn't distribute as well. That's the main difference. So it doesn't form, gold doesn't form a thin uniform layer. So you don't really have this overall conductive layer covering the TiO2, that's the main difference. and. So we're, we were trying to illustrate that you really need a uniform platinum or gold layer if you really want to improve the activity of these catalysts. Uh, how much platinum is there? As you, as you saw uh, in, uh, in the presentation, let's see if I can go back. So you can see that you really need uh, about, um, let me keep going. So you, you can get away with as little as pipe weight, uh, as, as low as a uh, uh, pipe weight percent of platinum. 
if you go any lower than five weight person, right? So that's why we went ahead and did 47 and half weight person iridium, two and a half weight person platinum. That five weight person platinum seems to be the limit. Beyond that, you don't have this continuous layer of platinum on TiO2 and the activity suffers. Uh, in terms of why we are trying to uh, um, uh, lower the P uh, PGM loading, you're right. That's basically to lower the lower the capital cost in our system. All right, thank you. And the other question is from Victor. Is asking uh, beyond all these engineering problems, is there any fundamental question regarding atom atomistic modeling that could help with material selection? So it's just like say it's, it's a concept of any problem. I mean, it would be anything about engineering that you're you're talking. Is anything is like probably theoretical modeling, atomistic approach that could help that you just say okay, based on this theory that you can also select the, the metal if, before trying error mini experiment already or combine them together because or always experiment is not enough. It should be also theory. Or theory is not enough. Experiment should also complement each other. Yes. Yeah, again, ex excellent question. And we really are trying to understand. We do, um, we do talk to theoreticians um, who work in this field. Uh, we, we would appreciate uh, somebody who, uh, who will help us understand how this iridium and platinum are interacting with each other in this catalyst layer. That would shed more light, uh, more light on the specifically how the iridium oxygen bond is changing during catalysis, right? So uh, we can get, uh, w it would be helpful to, helpful to get insight from uh, theoretical calculation, also from operando, operando experiments. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that would, be, that would be great. If somebody wants to do calculations and model these systems and uh, try, to, uh, try to help the investigations. Definitely. Uh, thanks. And other question is from um, David. Is asking if P PT can alloy radium, so um, which will very likely affect the intrinsic activity. Can you elaborate on how changes in electron structure induced by PT affect the radium activity? Again, excellent question. People have. Um, um, investigated iridium uh, platinum alloy, specifically for reversible fuel cell, starting in the early, uh, in early 70s when NASA, was for, NASA first got interested in it. Obviously, the first obvious thing to do was to make an iridium uh, platinum alloy and try to make them um, into a reversible system. Unfortunately, when you actually, when you have a pure alloy or actual uh, alloy of iridium platinum, to everyone's surprise, what ends up happening is the that alloy is neither is not good either for uh, OER or for either for fuel cell reactions or electrolyzer reaction. The electronic properties of both materials somehow end up changing so that they are less active, a lot less active than when you just mix the two materials together. That's where we got into the idea of uh, actually uh, just supporting one on top of the other or simply making a physical mixture instead of alloying them. I'm pretty sure there, is, there are uh, alloy phases out there that have activity in one direction or the other direction, or who knows, there is a phase that's active in both directions, but we haven't been successful at identifying a phase that's really active and stable. Thank you. Just a short other question is just about from Sam is asking if you have tried slot dye coating. Uh, uh, we have. The short answer is we have. Uh, Dr. Blazing, uh, do, we did try the modified version of Dr. Blazing, which is slot dye coating, and it does produce. Uh, uh, similar catalyst layer to what we get from Dr. Blading. Uh, yes, again, yes. excellent question. Another question is from Wenfeng. It's short. It's just a gas diffusion. What about a gas diffusion layer for fuel cell and electrochemical? Electro 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 is there and do you have any things about this? And did you investigate about gas diffusion layer? 
we are looking at gas diffusion layers. Um, one of the things with gas diffusion layers is uh, that um, if you can, in, again, com if you can control hydrophobicity or porosity, yeah, structure of and distribution of the pores in gas diffusion layers, it's always welcome. But we also have to understand that these gas diffusion layers are already commercially manufactured. They tend, that kind of research tends to be a slightly higher tier, TRL level research. Absolutely. Uh, if, if that's what, what the question was about. Right, thank you. And other question is, um, well, um, the attendee is asking if he's understanding that a uh, radium containing system deactivate during reaction uh, due to loss of uh, iridium. Is this also a problem for your radium palladium system? Um, system? As far as we know, almost any iridium catalyst that's employed on the anode of electrolyzer will, uh, will lose some iridium over time. Now that's one of the major reasons why commercial electrolyzers end up deploying five to six milligram per cm square iridium. So that even though iridium is dissolving over time really slowly, there is enough iridium to sustain your devices for 10, 15 years. That's the idea. Uh, what you can do, I don't, I don't know if we can ever completely stop iridium dissolution on the anode side. What people have been successful, we have been successful uh, at doing is we have been good. At, we have been able to reduce or uh, or uh, uh, or reduce the dissolution rate of iridium during uh, during electrolysis. Yes. All right. Thank you. These two uh, last question from Diana is asking why the combination of two. And base catalysts show lower efficiency for electrolyzing reaction, but good for fuel cells. Is it this good for fuel cells reaction too? It's the first question. And the second question is, did you check the distribution of both palladium and iridium? Are there, are there two catalysts distributed uniformly or equally or something like that probably? Uh, if we are talking about the regenerative system, we did map the distribution of iridium and platinum in the catalyst layer. They are homogeneously distributed there. Uh, uh, but we don't completely understand why uh, fuel cell performance actually goes down with increased amount of platinum in the catalyst layer. I'm, hope, I'm, I'm guessing that's what, the, that's what uh, Dina is asking. Uh, we don't completely understand, but it's quite baffling why 90% iridium, 10% platinum works better per fuel cell reaction than 70% iridium, 30% platinum. But I mean, if we look at this diagram itself here, right? This also shows that there are some uh, magic ratios, what I, if I may call them, right? There are some ratios that tend to work better per OER. Uh, something like this 45-5, uh, while other, other ratios, other combinations of iridium and platinum don't seem to work. Uh, I mean, we completely don't understand yet. Hopefully down the, uh, down the years, we'll understand how these systems are working at atomic level and we'll be able to give you a better answer in the future. Thank you so much. Uh... Dr. Rakmi, that was very interesting talk. It was a lot of question and it was enough uh, participant. I hope everyone enjoyed and learned about this um, informative talk and hope to see you again uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you everyone. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.